Now we're going to keep talking faith here at, uh, on day two of this human rights um, conference um, and particularly the matter of religious communities being more open and accepting of people of div diverse sexual and gender identities. The panel is called Keeping the Faith and I'm going to invite the panel onto the stage now. Ama Alka is, uh, Alfika is from the Global Interfaith Network for people of all sexes, sexual orientation, gender identities, expressions, representing East and Southeast Asia. He's the founder of a queer Muslim and allies group in Indonesia. He's a trans Muslim man, and he's intent on building that bridge between faith and sexuality in the Muslim religion. Dr. Timothy Jones is Associate Professor of History at La Trobe University. Tim spent decades researching the connections between gender, sexuality, and religion. He worked on the Royal Commission, institutional responses to child sexual abuse, and his research on conversion therapy has contributed to shaping the laws banning that practice in some of our states. And Jane Ozan is the founder of the Global Interfaith Commission on LGBT Plus Lives. She's a member of the Anglican Synod in the UK. She works with senior religious leaders to bring tolerance and diversity to the major faiths. Now we're going to, before we get into the panel discussion, we're going to kick off with a video presentation that Jane has coordinated with senior faith leaders in the UK declaring all lives deserve dignity and respect. We come together as senior religious leaders, academics and lay leaders from around the world to affirm the sanctity of life and the dignity of all. We affirm that all human beings of all sexual orientations, gender expressions and gender identities are a precious part of creation and are part of the natural order. We affirm that we are all equal under God whom many call the divine, and that we are all therefore equal to one another. We call for all to be treated equally under the law. We recognize with sadness that certain religious teachings have often, throughout the ages, caused and continue to cause deep pain and offense to those who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer and intersex. We acknowledge with profound regret that some of our teachings have created and continue to create oppressive systems that fuel intolerance, perpetuate injustice and result in violence. This has led and continues to lead to the rejection and alienation of many by their families their religious groups and their cultural communities. We ask for forgiveness from those whose lives have been damaged and destroyed on the pretext of religious teaching. We believe that love and compassion should be the basis of faith and that hatred can have no place in religion. We call on all nations to put an end to criminalization on the grounds of sexual orientation or gender identity for violence against LGBT individuals to be condemned and for justice to be done on their behalf. We call for all attempts to change, suppress or erase a person's sexual orientation, gender identity or gender expression, commonly known as conversion therapy, to end and for these harmful practices to be banned. Finally, we call for an end to the perpetuation of prejudice and stigma and commit to work together to celebrate inclusivity and the extraordinary gift of our diversity. Jane, you're responsible for gathering those faith leaders to make that, I must say, heartwarming declaration, reinforcing what we know to be true. So thank you for that. But can I ask you frankly today, how reflect, reflective are those sentiments towards LGBT plus people, the overall attitudes of the churches that these, they represent? Well, the truth is, I think religion has caused and is continuing to cause so much harm to the LGBT community. But there are, I would suggest, three groups in most religions. There are those who are vehemently vocal and anti, 
and uh, frankly preaching often a message of hate towards the LGBT community, there are affirming faith leaders and what we saw here, the Global Interfaith Commission brings together hundreds of senior faith leaders around the world, 35 countries, 500 faith leaders signed up to that, now thousands have. And then there's the silent middle, those who are on a journey because affirmation and, um, often happens in just one um, direction, people become affirming. But the silent middle, those who are privately affirming but don't feel able for all sorts of reasons, they don't want to get ostracized by their colleagues um, and need courage to speak out. And that's one of the reasons we formed the Global Interfaith Commission, was to give a lead amongst senior faith leaders in their community so that others could say, well, actually, yes, I agree to, and it's time I spoke out. For Did me, they speak with the imprimatur of their faith, of their churches? Well, each faith group has different um, hierarchies, if you like. So there are archbishops and chief rabbis and senior uh, Hindus, um, Buddhists and Sikhs who've, and Muslims who've signed up. But, you know, I've been working with the Pope. I met Pope Francis in 2019. And one of the statements you may have heard him recently make about calling for um, decriminalization, saying that it's not criminal, comes straight out of the declaration. So we're on a journey, but yes, they're speaking as senior leaders. We're on a journey, but you are a very senior member of the Anglican Church in the UK, a member of the Synod there. I wonder what your thoughts are about the comments from, or the advice really, from the Imam Muslim Hendricks we heard earlier, basically to tell people to don't try to remain inside the Orthodox Church, you know, live your faith outside because it's basically not, not a safe place there. For many it's not a safe faith place and I think we each have to discern what our calling is. I'm a woman of faith, I went through 20 years of conversion practices, it nearly killed me. But I've chosen to go back into that space because I feel called to that. Others need to, to protect themselves. Others will find an affirming um, faith space, which is terrific. I think the truth is we have to put ourselves and our, um, our self-care first. But faiths are only going to change when they encounter the lived reality of an LGBT person who is full of faith. And that is why some of us have chosen to stay. Amar, what's the situation for you in Indonesia, a predominantly Muslim country, of course, mm -hmm. in terms of attitudes to mm -hmm. LGBTQI plus people? Is there, is there any level of acceptance mm -hmm. and tolerance? How would you describe it? Well, um, uh, if I may, I would like to use this space uh, as a tribute uh, to, can I share my slide uh, for a moment? Yeah, so there is a slide um, about one incredible activist from Indonesia. Uh, she is in Taratri and she is uh, the leader of uh, uh, probably the first uh, Islamic school in Indonesia. And it is really inclusive space. And she is the champion of queer religiosity or queer spirituality or whatever you name it. But I think we need to really querying everything that has been used to, uh, you know, stigmatize us and marginalize us. And uh, what he's done in Indonesia is really incredible because not only for Muslim community, but also so he brings a lot of interfaith leaders from Indonesia to come to this place and to learn from trans women community there about being inclusive, uh, faith institution or, or faith spaces. So, um, and yes, there's a lot of, uh, the school was shut down in 2016. It was the hot uh, point in Indonesia where the government, local leaders, they, uh, they, they even implement conversion therapy. Uh, and it's, it's sponsored by the state. But uh, because of her and her community in, in Indonesia, um, it opens a lot of uh, eyes and hearts even from faith communities. They came to, um, you know, to apologize and starting uh, inclusive uh, narrative and interpretation. And I think it's, yeah, it's a mixed feeling to be a, a trans man in Indonesia, but I think there is a hope uh, coming from a uh, faith-based community. Um, yeah. So you see signs of, mm -hmm. of progress. Mm -hmm. That is one person, one school, mm -hmm. you know, the change is happening. But how high are the stakes for mm -hmm. the LGBTQ plus community in your country and mm -hmm. in other parts of Southeast Asia? How, how serious the oppression, how dangerous, mm -hmm. do you, mm -hmm. you know, how safe can you feel? Well, um, well uh, 
Yeah, in, uh, in terms of law, for example, there are several local government, they uh, just uh, issued a statement, like official statement against uh, LGBTQIA plus community there. And yes, no, um, to be honest, it's, it's not really safe. And it's surprisingly, I find faith space is more safer than, you know, the public spaces, uh, but particularly just progressive faith spaces because coming out to public it's you know it risks uh, my security uh, but again um, you know uh, uh, the, the, the beautiful spaces that has been built and um, mobilized by queer community of faith in Indonesia I think there is some uh, hope there. Tim you've been researching the connection between gender and sexuality and religion for 20 years or more this is a big question, but what changes in attitude and behavior have, have you mapped in that time? Is there something that stands out to you? Uh, so I've done research uh, looking at mostly uh, the, the history of religion and gender and sexuality uh, in the last 200 years in, in Western contexts. Um, I guess what, what really stands out to me is how slow religious institutions are to change. Uh, like they can work out uh, actually that uh, faiths don't need to be discriminatory, um, but there's something about religious communities that's, uh, that discrimination sticks in ways that, that it doesn't in other contexts. And I think, um, and in, in, some, in some ways, like looking at uh, what's happened in Australia and in, in many, many countries in the last 50 years, actually uh, things that are not central to faith, uh, views about sexuality and gender identity have become um, really valorized and elevated and become more important to, to religious conservatives than they were in the past. So there's like funny, there's funny things going on in that intersection between faith and sex. Yeah, I'm not sure if funny is the word we would use for it, but there's something going on right now. And proof of that is here in New South Wales, for those of you who don't live here, don't come from here, we are right in the middle of an election campaign where the issue of conversion therapy has been put front and centre by the independent MP Alex Greenwich, who will be along later today. Both major parties have now promised to ban conversion therapy in New South Wales. That deserves a round of applause. Some of the work you've done on, on conversion therapy has been used by other states to legislate to ban it. What do you think convinced those states of the need to do that? Or let me put it another way. This practice, I think, is an anathema to many Australians. Why is it still legal in so much of Australia? Um, so I was really privileged to be invited to do some research on this uh, about eight years ago, and I've been working on it since then, uh, from su survivor community, uh, from legal advocates, and, and with the Victorian government. Uh, most people just didn't think it happened. Like the, mm. the big... Uh, I the, didn't think it happened. Yeah, the, the big fight was to get people to recognise uh, that mainly religious groups, but also medical professionals uh, still attempt to change and suppress uh, people's sexuality and gender identity. And this happens to a shockingly large uh, number of people. Like the statistics that we have from Australia and around the world are that 10 to 20, and in some groups, 40 or 50% of uh, queer people are subjected to attempts to change who they are. Jane? Well, I think one of the problems has been that we've often used the phrase conversion therapy and we thought about therapeutic session, um, places like the, the psychotherapists or psychiatrists, and it has been happening there. But by far and away, the most common form in the West and indeed uh, in Africa and Asia are religious forms of conversion practices. And that brings us into that difficult contested space of freedom of religion or belief and various uh, religious leaders who believe that their right is to continue to pray the, the gay away or to exercise people versus the harm that that does and the recognition of that harm, which now many studies have shown. My own foundation, we've done research in Hungary and the Caribbean and the UK just to map the mental health in outcomes. Well, we heard it horrific. today. We heard from Anthony. We heard Absolute. from Rowe. We've heard, and we know. I mean, frankly, most of us have got friends, and sadly in this room here, many of you will know folk who've either been taken to that very dark place of feeling the only option is to look at taking their lives or indeed have sadly taken their lives. And those are stats that um, have not been often collated, 
But we know, and we hear the testimonies. The UN have done reports. The mental health professions have done reports. The church now is doing reports, as are other religious groups. And yet there is this willful blindness and this determination to carry on. And here in New South Wales, you've got some of the hardest lines, if I may, conservatives. The Archbishop um, uh, told his clergy not to even come and hear me talk because he believes that I'm so wrong in trying to defend the lives of LGBT people. So, so we have to have these discussions, we have to present them with the facts, and we need to engage. Just to stay with this for one moment, Jane, then when the Premier of this state, um, Dominic Perrottet, announced that his government would ban conversion therapy if re-elected, he also promised religious leaders in this state that any ban would not infringe on their rights to pray and preach on sexuality. So, is that a loophole? I mean, how do you well, hear me, that? For me, it is complex, but that, there is a loophole. When you pray with an individual one-on-one -on -one in a power relationship, religious leader or pastoral leader with a, an individual where you are praying for them to become straight or praying for them to be cisgendered, that will cause them harm. It is a religious practice, not just a belief. It's a practice, something you're doing. Uh, which causes harm. And international law is very clear that freedom of religion or belief has limits. It's only up until the point that it causes harm. Now, preaching is something far more generic. It's to an open uh, group. It's not directed at an individual. There's not the same power dynamic. And so um, many would argue that you can continue to preach, and that's how the legislation in many countries has been framed. But even then, that can be hate speech, and there's a fine line there too. I'm interested, Jane, you, you told us you've, you yourself have been through conversion therapy, but I think many, many years of it, I think. 20. Yeah. 20 years of it. Willingly. And yet, and yet you <laughs> come through that and your faith survives. Just, it's been really hard. I mean, I ultimately got to that point. I was hospitalized twice because of the stress. And the second time, I really just thought that I was going to have to walk away from my faith. And if any of you know my story, you can, uh, I have a book called Just Love. You'll know how key my faith was to me. I was living by faith. I've been in jungles being shot at. I've been in the White House. I've been places where my faith has taken me. And I thought I was going to have to walk away from God but God would somehow have to forgive me. But when I did come out, when I did embrace who I am, when I fell in love and my life turned into multicolor and I knew the joy of being loved and being able to love someone in return, I found my God walking right with me. And it's that that allowed me to keep that relationship. It's very different to often being in an institution or a church. Beautifully put. And I know there is an entire session on conversion therapy tomorrow, so if, you, if you're interested, there's more to be heard. But Amar, just on this notion, you've told us that conversion, conversion therapy is state-sponsored in many parts of Indonesia. How widespread is it, and, and who is it directed at primarily within that queer community? Uh, well, I, uh, uh, there is a research uh, that I did um, uh, two, two years ago during the pandemic. So we did uh, the focus group discussion for uh, analyzing the situation of trans men in Indonesia. And what I found out really surprising is that it spans across different faiths uh, or family, even the, the family that, uh, that uh, doesn't consider themselves religious. They also practice conversion therapy to their, uh, the, the family members who are part of the trans men uh, community. And uh, this, you know, uh, the reality is that, um, and it's uh, in, in Muslim community, for example, there is this called uh, Rukia, which is actually specifically for exorcism. And yeah, it happens in, in many cases, and sometimes it, it's really you know, physical, and sometimes there's a, a lot of sexual harassment going on there. And, uh, but again, like the school that, uh, you know, more and more schools, faith-based school, they, you know, they try to learn about uh, how harmful it is, the, the rukia that is, uh, 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 that is used as a conversion therapy for queer community, and that, um, yeah, we need to like knocking on doors like so many times to yeah to to yeah just, just to enlighten them and to educate them about the the harm that it causes yeah and on that harm mm. i mean the exorcism you've mm -hmm. said goes well beyond prayer obviously mm -hmm. 
um, and shockingly. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of violence is, too, if I may. Many mm -hmm. of the Muslim friends I know um, have literally had it, tried to have it beaten out of them or mm -hmm. tortured. And when we're talking, and, and even as far as sadly rape, you know, that we're, we're talking really violent forms yeah. um, exactly. often, which is horrific, which is why, again, mm -hmm. we have to talk about this with leaders and get them to recognize mm -hmm. the harm. Um, uh, yeah. As it's talked about more, is there pushback against it in Indonesia and Southeast mm -hmm. Asia more broadly? Um, well, I think it's more the, the, the people, even though the, the state is kind of, you know, try to more uh, anti-critic to the, the people, but there is a lot of uh, people movement that getting stronger and the solidarity coming from, for example, a uh, feminist Muslim group in Indonesia, we have, I think this is only in the world. So there is this association of Muslim feminist uh, scholar. Uh, they, they, did, uh, they are doing the conference together. And this is the space where queer community can be included. And we talk about, uh, you know, we advocate our rights within these feminist Muslim spaces. So I think it, it's good to have this kind of discussion going around within the faith spaces. It's not only uh, within Muslim, but also uh, even the Catholic and Christian uh, community uh, where they are willing to listen. So, okay. yeah, it's a good start. And as I mentioned, there will be a session dedicated to this mm -hmm. uh, tomorrow. Tim, just moving direction here. In Australia, we've spent the last couple of years debating a religious discrimination bill, which is still yet to materialize. But in this debate, the right to freely practice and express religious beliefs frequently comes right up against the rights of LGBTQI plus people not to be discriminated against. And we saw this in the Israel Folau case, for instance. How, how do we go at navigating those competing rights? Yeah, it's... Um it's really tricky, and I think, uh, well, it's, it's made to sound really tricky, but I think uh, one of the problems with uh, the debate is that it's a really distorted debate. We have a tiny minority of super conservative uh, religious people whose voices are being amplified uh, through this like journalistic phenomena of false balance. We've got to get people speaking on either side. Actually, it's a tiny group of people who want to, be, who want, uh, to maintain their legal right to discriminate. Uh, and actually the proposed legislation isn't going to affect them at all. And yet we keep talking about and elevating the, this, this like, apparent division and apparent conflict, actually as we saw in the marriage equality referendum in Australia and in most, in most contexts. Uh, the majority of people of faith support queer people. They have no problem. Uh, so I think there's a, something that's a little bit confected uh, about it. And I think if we looked at the real beliefs of actual religious people, including queer religious people, and if we looked at the spirituality of non-religious people, uh, the debate would look really differently. I want to come back to you in a second to talk about schools in particular within this debate around the religious discrimination, some kind of bill. But Jane, how, how do we work out what's a reasonable balance here? You know, or you know, as, as someone's right to make a decision based on their faith, if that implicates directly against someone's right to their uh, sex, sexual and gender identity? Well, I suppose there's a couple of points I want to make. Often it's framed as one group against the other, and in fact there's quite a large number of us in the middle. We are gay, we are bisexual, we are transgender, queer, and of faith. And so our rights too need to be um, considered. But when it comes to harmful practices, which is really where this um, rubs up against each other, as I said in, earlier, international law really is quite clear that you can have a freedom um, to believe whatever you like, but when you start to practice that in a way that causes harm... So that vilifies... That, that, to that's right. It. So we've recognised it in, in, often in, in, in quite violent forms, female genital mutilation, forced marriage. We recognise that's wrong. We've legislated against it. But when it turns on the Christian faith within Christian, supposedly pseudo-Christian cultures, everybody thinks, well, we're just being kind to each other. We're just smiling. We love you, Jane. We're just going to pray for you. Yeah, but it's still causing me harm. And so we have to define spiritual abuse. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we're in the UK trying to look at. I don't know if it's being looked at over here. We talk about sexual abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse. Spiritual abuse is when there's a power differential mm -hmm. and a teaching that causes harm. And that often requires, to date, we've just allowed religions to self-police. But actually, even uh, the former Archbishop Rowan Williams has started to talk about the need for an independent body to look at practices and say whether they are truly causing harm or not. And um, I think we just have to be honest and open 
about the fact that there are certain beliefs and practices that are causing people we know to consider taking their lives. And that's not a fact we can dodge around. So um, let's have an independent, independent body, let's look at defining spiritual abuse, and let's be honest. This happens in so many faith groups, and we need to find ways of protecting the most vulnerable. Just to follow that thread, I mean, if you set up that commission and there was a look at spiritual abuse, I mean, that's going to blow the lid off well, the I, churches, I, isn't it? I agree. Let me ask well, you I, and Amar for a view on that. I, I've said it's the greatest scandal yet to mm. be uncovered. We've had the sex abuse scandal in the church. Mm -hmm. I think the way that uh, churches and other faiths have treated the LGBT community is a huge scandal that is yet to be truly understood. And so... Thank you. But we have to break the silence on it. And I think um, there is a growing voice. People have been too scared or too broken, frankly. It's often been for the LGBT survivors to try and find a way of speaking out. Now we need those in leadership to do. And that's why the Global Interfaith Commission on LGBT Lives, last year uh, we met at the UK Foreign Office to agree some safeguarding principles, yeah. six safeguarding principles that we're recommending to all religions so that they look at how they treat their LGBT members and treat them with dignity, but with safety and protection, recognizing the vulnerability they have. Amar, how does that sound within the Indonesian context? Uh, well, I think, yeah, the denial level within faith community is huge. Uh, not only, you know, like uh, women abuses, but also queer abuses. Um, and again, it's, um, it requires a lot of like, effort coming from queer community too. Because to be honest, um, I, I have, I've heard a lot of, you know, uh, um, internalized uh, queer uh, internalized religious abuses within queer community itself because we have a lot of wound inside ourselves because uh, caused by these religious abuses right and then sometimes we are projecting that onto each other within our community i remember one night uh, a, a trans woman called me and she was crying because she was doing praying and then their trans woman friends mocked her because of doing the praying because and this is you know the reality we, we need to acknowledge within our community first mm. that you know we need to heal from that pain that it caused and that we need to just be kind with each other in terms of how we create uh, inclusive faith spaces for our queer of people of faith who need uh, who need that self-care and you know to just space to be you know to explore um, so and Tim, I know you want to talk about this notion of spiritual care, but just to follow that, Amar, mm -hmm. you know, you're a trans-Muslim man. Mm -hmm. As a person of faith, how do you believe in a merciful God when the religious leaders can be so cruel and violent mm -hmm. and the society mm -hmm. can be so cruel and violent? Uh, I think, uh, sorry, can I also share my slide because I have prepared uh, some actually uh, incredible statement by Sintaratri. Um, this is one of her famous statements. She said in, in many media coverage. Uh, yeah, I forgot to mention she, she passed away uh, three weeks ago. Right. And sadly, the property uh, uh, on which uh, the school uh, stand on um, now belong to the family. And I just heard that uh, it's, um, it's only available only this September this year. So it's, you know, it's, it's really sad, but but, uh, we are, um, you know, doing the fundraising to continue this. Uh, to find this another goal. property. Yeah. So this statement, uh, Allah does not see us based on our gender identity and sexuality, but what God sees is, uh, in us is our taqwa, which philosophically meaning our kindness and compassion to uh, and with others. You know, uh, a lot of time, religious leaders will preach about kindness, about humanity, but to be honest, it is our community queer community who are standing uh, for our humanity. It is us who are uh, fighting for love. It is us who, who, you know, who are fighting their preaching about being kind uh, uh, to others. So I think- You are the powerful. embodiment of Absolutely. a spiritual life. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. We are. <laughs> well, thank you. And Tim, I know this is something you've thought about a lot and researched a lot to this notion of just because you are denied a uh, place, place in a faith-based community where, where, where you feel unwelcome or you are not welcome um, should not be you are denied a spiritual life or the spiritual care mm. that we all deserve and need. Yeah, totally. Um, so, I mean, the research that I've done particularly on conversion practices 
uh, was detailing the mechanism of, uh, of spiritual trauma, religious trauma that people experience when parts of themselves uh, are put into conflict. Um, but it struck me actually like if you, if you invert that, uh, you get a recipe for good, safe pastoral care with queer people, and it's fabulous to hear, Jane, that um, you're making recommendations there. Um, but one of the interesting things, uh, obviously, as we talked before about how queer people and uh, people of faith are put into conflict, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, the, in the sort of culture war dynamics. Um, but they, that's against a background in Australia and around the world of falling, um, falling identification with religion. So uh, non-religious people are now the largest religious group uh, in Australia, and that's, that's happening around the world. Um, but non-religious people are often still spiritual people, still have a sense of uh, spiritual identity, want spiritual care, and I think that really needs to be taken seriously. And I think uh, the statistics that um, Adam Bourne and, and Ruth McNair gave yesterday about the really shockingly poor mental health of queer people um, show that uh, we need to take that pastoral care of queer people much more seriously. And, and are there any places, any examples where we see that pastoral care, which is you know, very often in many of our institutions provided by the churches actually, mm. where it is being offered and being accepted or trusted by the LGBT plus community? Uh, yeah. Tim and then, oh Jane you go. Well I mean there are a growing number of affirming churches, affirming mm -hmm. mosques, affirming uh, synagogues uh, and indeed there are many LGBT faith leaders themselves, you know we've got LGBT bishops, we've got LGBT rabbis. But Jane I think it's, sorry to interrupt but I think it's fair to say that given the cruelty that you've you know all yeah. identified, we've mm -hmm. spoken of, uh, LGBT people in many cases are not going to be trustful enough of to course. approach or... Well, it's about individual relationships, isn't it? And I think um, we will look at whole institutions and be concerned about them, but many of us will know people in our local community, perhaps, maybe not here in Sydney, but <laughs> in other parts um, of the world where you know of an affirming faith leader. So it's a mixed bag. But I think what I hope people can hear, A, is I, I personally am exceptionally sorry for the harm that so many people have suffered. But I know that God loves us each equally and yet has created us each with our unique diversity. And if you can't hear that in the church, hopefully you can hear that from those of us of faith who really want to, to witness that because God celebrates love, I know, in all its form. Yeah. Tim? Thank you. I guess it's a relatively new thing uh, in the public sphere and in research to acknowledge and understand the spiritual needs of non-religious people. I think one of, the, one of the sad things is that it's actually being uh, exploited very often by wellness industries, uh, by beauty and cosmetics and like uh, health stuff. People are- Self-care means yeah, look after your skin. Exactly, <laughs> it's being commercialized. Uh, and actually, uh, we need to think about how well people are actually being nourished and looked after, how much uh, people's sense of meaning and belonging and connection in the world and in community uh, is actually being served uh, by these uh, commercial services which are selling spirituality. Um, we're going to run out of time well before I'd like to, but can I just go back with you, Tim, to the debate that's been occurring in this country over the last few years around that religious discrimination bill, um, which you know, it has been described in the bill that was put forward by the former government, for instance, which is now gone, but was described by some as providing a right to discriminate on the basis of religion rather than as a shield from discrimination. One area where this was most contentious is within the schools debate and the rights of religious schools to employ only those who are of their faith, practice their faith, and has ended in result, you know, resulted in banning queer teachers and even banned queer students. Um, that's the sort of background to it. Actually, I'll bring Jane in here. Jane, again, that question of reasonable balance. How do we, how do we protect the, the school's right to have the sort of pastoral community they want to have without allowing them to, to sack Sack teachers people. or ban queer kids. It's really complex. Well, it shouldn't be so complex because we shouldn't have these barriers. But we've had equality legislation in the UK where the church has had and other religious organisations have had opt-outs, which is really quite ridiculous when you think about the church as part of the state. It's the established church. It shouldn't be allowed to opt out of its own law. And indeed, parliamentarians are now looking to remove those bans. 
But we have to respect, supposedly, people's beliefs. It's when those practices start to create harm. And again, we come back to, let's document that harm. Because holding a belief in itself, as a, even as a politician, you can have a belief. It's when you start using that belief to vote in perhaps such a way, like perhaps against same-sex marriage or uh, against abortion rights, that's when it starts causing problems. And I think that's the debate we have to have. Do you want to say something? Um, I, I guess it's really different in different contexts. In Australia, the, the vast majority of uh, religious schools uh, aren't really serving people of faith. They're serving people who think uh, that a private school will give uh, their kids a better education. Uh, so, <laughs> so <laughs> it's well, not true. You know, which, which is a comment on the level of funding and support for the public education system. There is a tiny proportion. I think there are maybe 400. Uh, schools that are really are in Australia devoted to raising uh, people in a conservative faith environment and the legislation will not affect uh, those schools. I just, it's a whole furphy, I think. Um, Amar, in, in your country, I mean, you've talked about the school mm. and you've, the fact you've singled out school makes us understand that schools generally mm -hmm. are, are not accepting mm. of, the, um, of the broader queer community. Um, are there, you know, are there, w would an LGBT plus person be employable in a school in mm -hmm. Indonesia more mm -hmm. broadly if their identity was known? Mm -hmm. And what about students? Uh, yeah, well, there are uh, several uh, famous um, trans women teachers uh, and also who are working with schools and also with the public servants. Uh, of course, it's just small numbers. When we talk about the you know, larger community, it's still school is really transphobic and um, particularly religious schools. Uh, so yeah, it's even in, in the university, I think it is also the impact of uh, the 2016 when uh, the, the, the government of education in Indonesia, they issued a statement that schools should be free from LGBTQIA plus community. So uh, that's schools really- Schools would be free of them. Uh, yeah, I mean like uh, they are, uh, schools should be free, I mean like, they, uh, they are not, uh, they are, we are not allowed to be in school or university. And it is a statement from the Ministry of uh, Education wow. back then in 2016. But uh, now, seeing that uh, a lot of discrimination happening and people uh, trying to criticize the government, I think, uh, and now that Indonesia now has a bill on sexual violence, which is really good, uh, good news, um, we started to uh, yeah, talk about uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the violence against LGBTIQ community Gee. in the school. Um, the red light is flashing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just telling us we've got to go, but let's ignore it for one more moment and um, <laughs> end this panel discussion where we started it with the challenge of trying to create an affirming future for sexual and gender diverse people within religious communities. Amar, can I just ask you simply, how do you see mm -hmm. the future for change? Uh, well, it's a mixed feeling, but uh, if I may say, um, you know, queer community, we are carrying the prophetic message, like I mentioned before. When scripture is saying about the compassion, it is always us who are at the front uh, of the community to say that we need to be compassionate, we need to be kind uh, with each other. And um, I, uh, so to close that, I, uh, I want to tell a story. So when I came out to my parents, so my parents are running Islamic school back home, and it was surprising because I was ready to kick myself out from home <laughs> with a huge bag. But then I was surprised to know that my father hugged me and he said, this is your takdir. Takdir means destiny. So I couldn't reject you for who you are. And I think queer, as a queer person, uh, as a queer community, we, are, uh, we, we bear the queer destiny. And our queer destiny is to win our love and humanity. So thank you. <laughs> Um, uh, it's not the first time I've shed a tear today, but I am shedding a tear. So, uh, Tim, in all the research you've been doing for so long, this is a hard question too. Do you see signs and, and tips for improvement, or do you see slippage as we stand here? The biggest, clearest historical trend uh, is that people are getting less religious. Uh, but I think what's also happening, what we're seeing, uh, is that uh, being less religious doesn't mean that we're not spiritual, and I think the, the queer community is one of the least religious communities. In Australia, 75% of LGBTQ people do not identify with religion, but we still have uh, spiritual care needs, and we need to look after ourselves and look after each other. Well said.
And Jane, as you've told us, you've written a book about this. It's, it's called Just Love, I think. Why, and I'm sure you've been asked this question before, and I think it goes perhaps to the well of graciousness that Ro Allen spoke about earlier, but why, after all you've been through, do you maintain your faith, and what gives you hope for an affirming future? Well, God is a God of love, and love always wins. You know, I think love is stronger than fear. I think light always dispels darkness, and there is quite a, you know, a lot of darkness at the moment. It's a lot of pu pushback, but the great news is that there's a younger generation, um, even a younger generation in the church and in our religious groups who are um, aware of the power of love, who see um, love in LGBT people, and are, many of them are LGBT people, and they are growing up, and they are challenging their elders and their leaders, and boy, I, change only seems to happen in one direction. But what we need is people to break the silence, to speak out, to recognize the harm, to find their voices, and we need our allies to stand. It's been on the shoulders of our, us, the LGBT community, for far too long. But know that you're loved, know that you're lovable, know that God loves us, because that's what sustains me, even in my darkest moments. Thank we you. are all lovely and lovable, and love always wins. Let's go with that. Could you please thank <laughs> Amar al Fikar, Timothy Jones, thank and you. Jane Ozan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And um, before we finish with this whole issue uh, and topic today, we're going to listen to an address by Simran Stul Panagal. So stay, stick around. I'm sad that I'm not with you today, but that I'm speaking from Kharkiv, almost walking distance from the Russian-Ukrainian border, where air raid sirens fell to the night, and we're seeing an entire people's rights, their life, and liberty assaulted, which is something you're also discussing today. I've been asked to comment on religious freedom and how the movement to protect faiths, which is at play here as well, might interact with those who cherish each person's right to their sexual orientation and gender identity. As a Sikh, Religious freedom comes easy to me because we believe that the divine transcends everything, everyone, and that it's our duty to protect the sacred journey of every unique soul to its destination. In the religious freedom movement, I see members of all faiths and none doing exactly that, working side by side to oppose the domination of anyone's conscience by the beliefs of another. Crimes committed against religious groups are the most horrendous we can imagine. Just take a look at the plight of the Uyghurs, Rohingya, the Zaros, the Sidis, Ahmadiyya, Tibetan, and so many other groups. They include active genocides, modern day concentration camps, sex trafficking, organ trade, torture, and executions for blasphemy, and so much more. Many of these things are familiar to you. But let's be frank to many LGBT people, the term religious freedom is a code for a movement that seeks to dominate you and confiscate your basic dig dignity. Religious freedom can be seen as a movement that wants to deny your very existence and continue the degradation of LGBT children, which leads to the endless horrors you know so very well. And let's keep being frank. To conservatives in the religious freedom world, the LGBT agenda seems bent on outlawing religion and program youth to turn away from God. They see it as wanting to destroy the moral fabric that holds society as they know it together. It's not difficult for us to imagine that these polarities won't rest until one or the other is destroyed. Both sides are committed to their cause. But that destruction won't happen. There is another view that can bring us together. It's called covenantal world. And it believes that the humanity of victims must always come first and be defended by us together. In practical terms, let's think about the military withdrawal from Afghanistan. All minority communities, communities were decimated. Women's rights disappeared overnight, as did the rights of Christians, Sikhs, Hindus, Hazaras, and many others who quickly started getting murdered. The Sikh wedding in Kabul was bombed, and the funeral procession right after for the 25 killed was also bombed. Of course, the quietly hopeful LGBT community, the pain of death, also lost its right to exist completely. As humanists remind religious institutions that any one belief system gains control, the police become thugs, the judiciary corrupts, women's rights disappear, the right to freely and openly believe goes away, the free press is gone, and of course sexual and gender identity equally revert to the Stone Ages. This humanistic challenge to religion feels so accurate to me that I don't want to imagine a world with 
Tav. But according to covenantal pluralism, those with opposing beliefs would not only have an equal right to an evacuation from Afghanistan, but both sides would seek to bring the other to safety. After the Sikh bombings, Jewish and Christian groups supported evacuations as the Sikhs left. That's covenantal pluralism. Of course, the LGBT community must be indomitable and must use all tools available to protect LGBT members that exist in every faith, to be openly proud and to claim your right to be cher cherished. As an ally, I'm with you in that fight always. And as a person of faith, I'm ashamed and deeply sorry for the harm religious institutions have caused and continue to cause. And still, as a member of the religious freedom movement, it's not my place to question the beliefs of another. I actually have to protect the right to hold those beliefs and to ensure that no church is burned because they regularly are, that no one is trafficked for their faith, which happens mercilessly, and that no member of the LGBT community is assaulted or tortured or worse, which we know happens all too often. We don't get to covenantal pluralism by demonizing religions from the outside, though. Faiths have to work things out internally. We know that their institutions change, as they have throughout history. What can change is our joint commitment to human dignity. And if, you, if you'll allow me, I want to challenge us. I want to call on us to find a group that has a conviction that's very different from our own. I want us to identify and stand up for the most vulnerable in that group who are certainly being persecuted horribly somewhere in this world. If we do that, we can reach hearts and gain fierce allies who will fight with us to defeat the evil in this world. Simran for that very thought-provoking message recorded in Kharkiv in Ukraine just because so badly wanted to get that message to us today. So let's in, end this session this morning on that mantra I think will hold close to us which love always wins. That concludes the morning plenary sessions for the second day of the conference. Yeah.